Hi everyone. Yeah, uh, my name is Dacia, as mentioned, and this is Mark. Hi. Uh, we come from Feature Space, and uh, the name of our talk is Lessons from 100,000 Lines of Elm in Production. So our product is live and deployed with our clients in some of the world's largest banks, insurance companies, and gaming organizations. Um, we developed a product called Arik Fraud Hub. Uh, Arik is a real-time machine learning software system that spots anomalies and pro on the processed events. This allows our customers to block new fraud attacks uh, through, among other things, uh, an outputted risk score. Uh, and also help recognize genuine customers without blocking their activity. So, within Arik, our UI team uh, is responsible for the interface with our users. Uh, this is basically composed of a server-side web API written in Java Spring and a client-side uh, single-page application written in a mix of uh, JavaScript, Angular, and Elm. This UI is not public-facing. Uh, it is used by internal teams of our clients and uh, it provides two main features to our users. Uh, firstly, a case management system that allows the teams of fraud analysts to review the cases flagged by the system. And secondly, rules uh, and configuration editing that allows the analyst specialists to adjust and update the system configuration. Um, other features like reporting, dashboards, or tracking of the system status are also available. So this, uh, where we use Elm is in the front end of this application that runs in the browser. It's a large, complicated, single page application. Uh, the routing table for the application has about 130 different patterns in it, and of course they match against different entities. We've got about 135,000 lines of Elm code at last count in the system, plus about 50,000 lines of JavaScript code. Some of that is from the original Angular application and some of it is JavaScript that we use to support uh, the Elm code by uh, accessing via ports. We port out to JavaScript in uh, last count uh, 83 different ports in the application. So I'm trying to give you a sense of what we work on. We're not a product shop where things travel through and we get another product. This is the same big application. Um, it's quite large and complex. This is the, what it looks like on the login screen. Those glitches are deliberate. That's part of our branding. Um, here are the screens. Some of these are CRUD update screens just against um, a REST endpoint. They're relatively straightforward, but I'll explore some of that in a minute. And some of them are complicated. The configuration for the machine learning system can be versioned, and the system supports rolling back and forward to different versions. And one of the interesting challenges is displaying the diffs between all of those configurations in the UI. I'm not going to show you that, but I am going to show you this. Uh, this is um, the code editor for our custom rules language with uh, syntax highlighting. So the editor here is an embedded ACE editor, JavaScript editor embedded in Elm. Uh, then we have a, a unit testing framework for the rules all built in um, Elm and executed by Elm. Over here is another interesting page. This shows the history of all the things that have happened to an entity in the world of our clients. So, for example, all the things that one of the customers have done, all the events that have been tracked over time. And that might be a large list, maybe a long list. So we have a custom scroll bar over here, and we do a kind of infinite scroll where we only render the parts of the canvas that are underneath the viewport. There are a bunch of other complicated uh, screens in here, but I wanted to give you a flavor of the, of the complexity and width of the application. So yeah, um, to give you a little more, bit more context on how the UI evolved over time, 
we are now going to show you its development timeline. Uh, development started around April 2014 uh, using the Angular 1 framework. We should also mention that uh, Angular 2 have been first announced back in 2014 and would uh, only be, have been released by September 2016. Uh, most news about new major version were, uh, of Angular were describing it as uh, drastically different. So uh, by June 2016, the project had about 45,000 lines of JavaScript. Uh, and with the increasing complexity uh, of the application and a high rate of uh, new features planned for next releases, we decided that it, we had to move on from Angular 1 and search for a better tool that could help us manage this growing code base. So we experimented with a few options, and between them were uh, Elm, React, Redux, uh, Angular 2, still in, under development at the time, uh, between many others. Uh, but uh, we, we rapidly fell in love uh, by Elm and saw that it would allow us to combine some of the features that we uh, saw on other tools and uh, frameworks. Uh, this included things like uh, the immutable data that we saw versus the libraries like immutable JS, pure functions where Redux talks about uh, writing pure reducers, uh, the strongly typed aspect of the language versus tools like uh, TypeScript, and all these are available in Elm like we all know, and also having the guarantees like uh, no runtime exceptions and uh, associated great performance, those were things that actually uh, uh, helped us a lot uh, to, to make this decision. So especially these three last uh, uh, points also helped us pitch this idea to our boss, uh, the director of engineering within Feature Space. And given that we use uh, Java extensively across the company, the management understood the benefits of a strongly typed language. And by the end of 2016, we had our first feature in Elm merged into master. And we started by replacing some parts of the application with Elm components. And uh, as time passed and we felt more conf confident about Elm, uh, we started parting the outer skeleton of the application into Elm code. Um, and by the early 2017, we had switched from an Angular app uh, with embedded Elm to an Elm application with embedded Angular uh, pages. This, this was all done in context to a high rate of new features, like I said, coming in, uh, as well as a growing team. So currently we're composed of eight people within the UI, including a designer and two back-end developers. And uh, if you're wondering about this line, we probably have Thomas on our team. He is feature space employee number three. He mostly works on the server. So what was our experience after making the choice to switch to Elm? What was it like making that changeover? Um, we like the way that Elm supports developers' workflow. An individual developer can write new code, effectively making changes to type signatures or to models and tracking down all of the uh, compiler issues and moving forward that way. We, we're familiar with that. Another frequently claimed benefit of Elm is that it makes refactoring better. Where does refactoring fit into it? And where do the, the checks that the compiler gives us, the type checks and the completeness checks that we get from the compiler, fit into that story? We like to have a robust testing environment to, to empower us to refactor. We have unit tests. We have functional tests that use Selenium. The engineering team as a whole, including the back end, have a dedicated QA department, have automated tests that also drive the user interface, but we always want more. The tests that we write act as a kind of verification of correctness at the level that the developer was thinking about it when they write the tests, right? The tests encode an idea of correctness that you hold in your head and you're thinking about it at a particular level. And maybe the compiler can help us catch some of the things that we weren't thinking about. What I mean by level is stuff like this. 
Here's the screen where we create new users. One definition of correctness for this is, can I create new users? Another level that we might be thinking about and that we have to take into account is, does the password and password verification field work together correctly so that you have to type the right stuff in? We might write a test for that. Um, there's some interesting stuff here where the username field, you type in a username, but we don't want to create a user unless the username is unique, so we have to ask the server. So we're debouncing the keystrokes, and then we send off a request to the server, and we wait for it to come back. During the debounce delay and the round trip, we don't know if the username is unique. But we don't want to display the error message saying that the name has already been taken, because we don't want that to be flashing on and off. But likewise, while we're waiting for that and we don't know the answer, we don't want to enable the submit button that says create up here because we don't want to create users where there's the possibility of duplication. So the verification logic for this field has to behave differently with respect to showing the error message than it does with respect to enabling the cancel button, and we might write a test for that. So we're trying to, to think at different levels of complexity, and we find that uh, that forms a framework like this Wattle and Daub house, and then the compiler is keeping you honest and checking for the things that you didn't think of and filling in the gaps. So the Elm compiler is like the straw and mud stuffed into the gaps in this framework of correctness, right? Helping us to have a more sound structure. We switched our tooling from JavaScript to Elm, but the world didn't stop and let us rewrite our application in Elm. There was constant pressure to deliver new features at the same rate, and we had to learn on the job. We didn't have time to get our team skilled up to become great Elm developers on day one. We had to learn as we were going along. In the Angular application, we had the ability to create new CRUD screens against an endpoint relatively straightforwardly by creating a configuration, a JSON configuration that described the fields, the validation, the endpoint, and it would generate those screens. We didn't have that in Elm. When we needed to rewrite one of those pages into Elm, the reason that we were doing that is because we needed to extend and enhance it somehow, not because we were trying to build that same equivalent framework in Elm. Besides which, as we were learning the language, that wasn't the right time to do that framework construction work. We needed to figure out how do you write a CRUD screen in Elm that takes into account all of those complexities that I just described for, you know, within a form. Even a form has some complexity. And of course, with constant pressure to deliver new features, once you've made one of those forms, the quickest way to next, make the next one is to copy one that you already did, right? You've, you've all done that? <laughs> but it's high risk, right? We, we forget to rename things, we include things that we don't want. It's a high risk strategy. We find that adding the compilation step at the end of copy and paste helps us to somehow mitigate some of the risks of copy and paste programming. So we were under a lot of pressure to uh, deliver features having made this change of technology. Um, we needed to learn, we needed to start from scratch. And, you know, fortunately, we have great tools. I'm just going to leave that up there long enough for it to find its way onto Twitter. <laughs> But like Thor's hammer, you know, these great tools give us power, but we have to use it carefully. And this is where the idea for the subtitle of this talk came from. We need to take this guy's advice into account. Or was it Voltaire? With any amount of power, you get a commensurate amount of responsibility. We don't really wish to be building a system with lots of copy and pasted code. We want to do better. We want to have a well-structured application where, for example, the, you know, the, the thing that I described about enabling the submit buttons, we don't want to write tests for that on every page. We want to say our framework provides us with this. And so we're beginning now to develop those frameworks and tools and higher level structures that take us up to a smarter level. And, you know, we're, uh, we're finding that we can use the refactoring support that Elm gives us to backport those improvements into the large code base. This application is complex. There's a lot of code because there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done. 
there may be ways in which we can reduce that as we get better, but a lot of it is there just because there's a lot of complicated edge cases. And so we have large files. Last year, Evan talked about the life of a file and mentioned that fear of unwanted accidental side effects is one of the things that sometimes drives us to create small files. And you know, we haven't done that too much. We have large files. We have files that are of code that are much larger than they would have been if we'd built this in JavaScript. And we've been able to take our time in refactoring those and improving them. As the team's skill improves, we're getting better. We're becoming really good Elm programmers. As a team, we're working better together on our aspirations and our wishes for what the code base would be like are improving. And we're finding that we can backport those changes back into the code base because of the great refactoring story that we have with Elm and our tests. There were some perceived challenges to switching to Elm. We had some interesting technical challenges making Elm and Angular live together during the, uh, the, the changeover. You, you may have noticed from the graph that the, Elm, the number of lines of JavaScript code hasn't gone down much. We don't really want to tinker too much with that Angular code because it isn't worth the risk of changing that stuff. Once all of the Angular pages have gone, which they haven't yet, then we expect to see that drop. But in the meantime, we're managing it. So they needed to live together in different ways. When we want to render a page with Angular content, uh, the update gathers the data that the Angular code needs and sends it out via a port. The port requests the animation frame with a callback that's going to render the Angular content. The Elm view renders the DOM, including a node, which will be the root of Angular's content. And then when the callback runs, the Angular app runs and renders the rest of the content at that point. Angular uses the root to decide what to display, but in some pages we have more than one occurrence of Angular code on the same root. So we could select that by passing additional data into the packet, but we don't want to spend a long time engineering those things in the Angular code that's eventually going out. So sometimes we do a trick like this. Uh, where in this case, there are three different versions of this um, modal dialog which are rendered by Angular, and it depends on circumstances that are known, that used to be known to the Angular app, but now we only have the dialog. Elm knows that stuff, so Elm puts a class on one of the ancestor elements of the Angular part, and we use CSS to hide the parts of the Angular code that we don't want the user to interact with. Uh, building on continuous integration servers has been a challenge. It's fixed now, but for a while we had the wrong stack on our CI servers and we weren't able to build the Elm code on there, and so we were checking in the compiled Elm JS into version control. We wondered if it would be challenging to hire new staff with this language that nobody has heard of. We like our front-end developers to have some functional programming experience and a willingness to learn Elm. So that acts as a kind of filter, and we're finding that it's attracting smart, well-motivated people to us. So at the moment, that's working out OK. This is a big app with a lot of module dependencies. It takes a long time to compile the app. You can safely go and read your email, and maybe somebody else's email, and maybe make some tea. And like, there's a lot, the limit to how long you can hold that thought process in your mind, and eventually you're like, OK, I've done my thing, and I come back, oh, it's still not finished yet. And then it breaks your concentration, and that's a risk to us. So having that kind of break in the flow is really a problem to effectiveness. and. Um, we're looking forward to Elm 19 with better compilation performance to try and take some of that away. So in conclusion, we think that choosing Elm was a great choice for our situation. And I want to just re rehash that the situation we are in is we're not an agency doing small projects and moving on. We have a big, complicated product with a lot of code, and we're going to be working in that code base for the foreseeable future. That's the situation that we're in. We have a team, you know, the, you've seen the team, we're down here, a lot of people working on this code base. We like the way that Elm supports the individual developer workflow. We like integration of the compiler and the checks into our kind of editor workflow and using that to drive forward changes. We like the way that Elm supports us working as a team. We use Elm format 
to make the uh, version control diffs look pleasant to deal with. Uh, we also like being able to run the compiler after resolving merge conflicts as an extra level of confidence that you've done the right thing. We're using Elm to manage this large, comple complex application. We're using it to manage this complexity. First of all, we had to just throw it up there. But the ability to refactor means that we can make incremental changes and improvements to the quality of that without breaking things as we go along. So we find that instead of having dark corners of the code base that we daren't touch, we feel a little bit like that about some of the Angular parts. But the Elm parts are within our ability to, to improve over time. So we feel like this large code base is actually improving over time as well as continuing to grow. So we're a feature space. We're based in Cambridge, UK. We're sponsors of the conference, and we're hiring. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Desio. Uh, does anyone have questions for them? Okay. Uh, hi. I have only one question. Uh, what build do you? What tool do you use to build your app? Like, why is the compilation time uh, an issue? Because like we have a similar situation. Like also like 50k lines of Angular code and like twice as small, uh, the less the amount of the Elm code, but the compilation speed is what is it? <laughs> it's freaking out now in real time. <laughs> yeah, the uh, initial, it's fine. Yeah, yeah the initial yeah, is like 14 seconds. How much? Uh, what, what, what 14, tools, what, what if like tool, from zero. What and tool are we using to, what, what tool chain are we using? Like to is it Webpack, yeah. Gulp, or like something else? No, we're just using uh, uh, Elm Make directly through uh, a make file just to, to organize our product, but th that's, that's not related to the Elm compilation in, in specific. We just go straight to Elm Make. Okay, so uh, it takes how long for you to compile? Uh, I think it's about 20 minutes. Yeah. We had a plan to run so the compiler while we were doing the talk, actually. <laughs> no, uh, actually, so it's not always 20 minutes, of course, right? So if you just delete the, the build artifacts folder and start from scratch, it will be 20 minutes. If you touch on files that are used across the, the, the app, it will take about could take about 10 minutes, uh, but yeah, if you, it's just a small uh, file, it could take uh, one, two minutes, uh, sometimes, depends. All right, thanks. We, we should probably talk. <laughs> okay. Be gentle. <laughs> no, just to clarify, the, the, in 18, there's certain features that if you use in certain ways, they can cause these kinds of uh, longer, longer compile. So there's likely a way with 18 to bring that down significantly. Let's have that conversation. Yeah, can, can, can we also talk? So you said you uh, changed from embedding Elm uh, modules into the Angular shelf to uh, having Elm shell uh, and M Angular in it. So how, how does it work for you? Like, uh, like how do you communicate with the Angular app and initialize it and so on? So yes. So. Uh, uh we need some information on the site. Uh, I guess the main benefit from that transition is that we can keep state across the multiple pages that we didn't have before on, on Angular. Uh, there are specific situations where you actually want to keep that state. Uh, so how we do it is, for instance, the current user state is owned by Elm, and we pass that on onto Angular. And the specific cases we have, that initial uh, uh, context is enough to then for Elm to take over and just, just decide from that. Yeah. OK, so please keep talking to them during the break. Uh, we will get back here in 30 minutes. So thanks again, Mark and Desia. Yeah.